Hello, everyone. Welcome to Community Bookstore's virtual event series. My name is Noah Mintz. I'm the store's event coordinator. Community Bookstore is currently celebrating over 50 years of business, and we credit the continued support of readers and writers for this milestone. So thank you all for spending the evening with us. I'm very thrilled today to join with our friends at New York Review Books in welcoming Marina Warner for the release of Esmond and Elia, an unreliable memoir in conversation with Francis Wilson. Now to some housekeeping before I introduce our guests, we've enabled Zoom's auto transcribe setting. So if your version of Zoom is up to date, click the live transcription button at the bottom of your screen to enable closed captions. If you have any questions for tonight's guests, please click on the Q&A button, which is also at the bottom of your screen. Uh, we will be asking them at the end of the program, so please don't be shy. There's also a chat box through which I will be posting a link to buy tonight's book if you haven't already. Um, and one caveat for tonight is that we're all at the mercy of our home internet connections, so please do bear with any technical issues that could arise and we will try to resolve them quickly. We are entering into a bit of a slow season for the summer uh, in terms of events at Community Bookstore, but we do have some really exciting ones planned for you. Um, so do head over to our website, communitybookstore.net, and sign up for our newsletter to stay up to date. One in particular that I would like to point out is on Wednesday, July 13th, we'll be hosting Mary Ziegler, who is the author of Dollars for Life, the Anti-Abortion Movement, and the Fall of the Republican Establishment. She will be in conversation with litigator, author, and activist, Julie F.K., whom we also hosted for her last book, Controlling Women. That program is up on our website now and taking registrations. So now a little about tonight's guests and we will get started. Marina Warner's study of religion, mythology, and fairy tales include Alone of All Her Sex, the myth, of the cult, myth and the cult of the Virgin Mary from the Beast to the Blonde, and Stranger Magic, um, which was a National Book Critics Circle Award for Literary Criticism winner, as well as a Truman Capote Award winner. Forms of Enchantment, Writing on Art and Artists. A fellow of the British Academy, Warner is also a professor of English and creative writing at Birkbeck University of London. In 2015, she was given the Holberg Prize, and in 2017, she was elected president of the Royal Society of Literature. And Frances Wilson is a biographer and critic. Burning Man, The Trials of D.H. Lawrence is the recipient of the Bi Biographers International Organization's 2022 Plutarch Award. So without any further ado, I will leave it to you. Marina, Francis, thank you both so much for joining us this evening. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Marina, what a pleasure it is to talk to you about your memoir. I have well, I'm thrilled that you want to do it. It's very funny for, um, for the audience in America. Marina and I are actually on the same road in London. So uh, <laughs> <laughs> we could be sitting together. I, um, I see you as our contemporary Scheherazade. You have been for 50 years now telling us tales. You, you write about myths and legends and icons and fairy tales, and you take fantasy seriously and have a deep instinctive understanding of both the power of narrative and the power of women. And this for me is the subject of Esmond and Elia. Does that sound like a, does that sound like a, a, oh, this, a wayward description of the memoir? Not at all. No, I'm thrilled that you feel that about it. I, um, in, in some senses, it does have aspects of fairy tale. And I, in, in that it, there was such an improbable marriage, my parents. I mean, it was not only brought about by chance, as often happens, of course, with relationships, but they came from such different worlds. My mother was born into southern Italy was born the year Mussolini came into power and she actually left the year he fell when she married my father and my father was born to a completely different world of cricket something not very familiar to American audiences um, but the national game then and he and that grandfather my father's father was a kind of national hero so the two worlds were very very far apart and um, and then they went to live in Cairo which um again, was another dimension. I think my father was chasing the tail end of a fairy tale there, which was, I'm afraid, a fairy tale of colonial power. Yes, yes. It's, um, I think that your father comes out of this, uh, out of this book very sympathetically. I don't, don't know whether you'd agree with that. I felt very sympathetically towards him. In the book is much more about your mother, about the power of your mother and the myth of the mother. And this woman who is iconic in her own right, I felt as if I was exploring the kind of the roots of your intellectual life. 
in in many ways but i did feel that your father and your father was a figure a, a figure of caught up in a whole set of romances that were fast disappearing would you describe would would you agree with that completely yes he was a yes he was a, a damaged man i mean he he had had that upbringing where he was sent away you know from home at a very young age and he never really in the home he just had a dream of his home and and he was chronically short of money because though he'd been brought up to be a spender and to just live the, the high life he um you know, did, never had the means to do that but he was flawed you know he had this real fatal flaw which is that he had a terrible temper so he alienated the love of my mother quite early on and and he alienated his daughter's love too because he went he had these sort of rages that are like Othello's, you know, or Lear's in these absolutely, these, these kind of, he wasn't an old man when he started having them, but these old man rages that um, simply splintered his personality and just, and that splinter would just fly through the entire surroundings and everybody would be damaged. And then afterwards he would sort of really remember that he'd been so enraged. And it was, it was, it really was, you know, a tragedy for him as well as as, as difficult for us. And um, but I, I mean, I'm pleased you found him sympathetic because I found when I started writing the book that my mother completely took possession of me. I felt so strongly that her ghost was speaking to me. It was, and she entered my dreams, and she still does. I still dream of her yeah. now. That I mean, it reawakened all my connection to her. She's been dead now over ten years, but. Um, and, and I thought that maybe I'd done him an injustice, actually, because he was a, a rather emancipated father when it came to the education of girls. I mean, he certainly supported me and my sister throughout. Yes. I thought your descriptions of him teaching you to swim and teaching you how to how to um, how to swing on the on the swing in the um, in the local <laughs> park were very, very touching. And I also felt that, you know, this was, I mean, it is a it's a fairy tale for him in many ways in marriage because here he was a man nearing middle age, mm. balding man, myopic, nearing middle age, meeting an absolute what the pre-Raphaelites would call stunner, meeting this 21 <laughs> year old stunner, this five foot eight and a half beauty. I mean, she was a, she was a Hollywood beauty and she had a fantastic spirit and a wonderful nature. And she came on to him. Yes. She said to him, what about me? Yes. And then she describes herself. She described herself to you when you say that it was uncomfortable to hear, but as the sexually more active yes. part. No, that, was a, that was a revelation that I made because I inherited a lot of papers. I found that the garage at home was absolutely full, stuffed full of trunks, full of papers, which was an unbelievable resource for a writer. And, it, and the book, I had already started writing the book when she was alive, because I wanted to write about Egypt and that period, and the final denouement, which was when the, the bookshop my father had started there was burnt down in the 1952 revolution. This was a very complex sort of childhood memory for me and full of historical reversion. But um, I inherited all this material and it, it really changed, the, changed my perception of it all because, yes, and because I found that she had had of this very reflective life. She'd written all these diaries. They they were excruciating to read. I, it was so painful, and and um, you know all her her adventures, her, her love affairs, her um, her unhappiness. You know, it was all in Italian. So quite difficult for me to read and very spiky handwriting. But I nevertheless I and I, sort of other personality because she'd been downtrodden by my father, deprived of liberty and, and really, and um, you know, she's, the reason I'm a feminist is because I saw that, that um, dynamic between them, of the, the man who has the money, making it, who was making the money, not that much, but keeping under his thumb, you know, this, a woman of high spirits. He didn't quite succeed. She, she managed to get away, she became a teacher, and managed to you know in some ways make a life for herself but nevertheless I saw her as a downtrodden person and then I found in the diaries that she was you know so full of different feelings that she concealed and pr protest and it was fascinating but also painful 
extraordinary something of a kind of something of a fantasy isn't it discovering your mother's diaries after she's died and it's like I'm peeling off a layer of myth of the parent's life yes now, what was, no, uh, one of the, the, most... intim the intimacy is quite shocking actually I mean they're yeah. the people we possibly or certainly have made most impression on us but they're the people we know least too in some ways yeah. because in some ways we can't know them intimately it's a kind of forbidden territory yes now, you describe very vividly in the first sections of the book the way that your, uh, your mother's arrival in London from her, um, from her South Italian village with its, its extreme obscene beauty and coming to kind of war-torn, blasted London with soot everywhere and learning to become a stiff, upper-class Englishwoman, can you say something about this strange process of metamorphosis, but also masquerade, which re yes. returns in the book again and again, where everyone is masquerading as everyone else, and Englishness is very much a masquerade as as, as it's um, enacted in your family, in your father's family. Mm. Yes, it's a continuum of sort of manners, customs, clothes, uh, prejudices, values. Yes, a whole and and and. The, the life when she escaped from you know Italy war torn terrible fascist Italy and she escaped and um, married in, into this sort of you know up, up sort of upper class middle upper class family um, she made a bargain and then she yes she passed she passed and I, I try I try and the, the book is written in, as a series of evocations of objects and the object that I chose to really to, to symbolize this metamorphosis were the lace-up walking shoes that my father gave her as a birthday present in the first year of their marriage. She was 25 or even younger, actually, maybe. And, um, and um, the, the brogues, which are now very fashionable. And um, so I wrote about, about those. Do you want me to read that bit? Yes, Should please. I just read one tiny bit? Yes. Do you know? So this is... I mean, I, I, in each of the each of the things, the objects that I use as kind of magic objects that are stored where memories are stored, I describe them in a very realistic fashion, and then I kind of open them up to try and see what the personal meanings are. Yes. So, so the peel brogue, they were made by peels, a, a, a famous in those days, famous custom customized shoemaker in the Burlington Arcade in London. The peel brogue is a woman's version of a man's shoe, and the style has made a very strong return in the last few years, filling the fashion pages in the windows of shoe shops from Bond Street to Madison by urban professionals, especially young women. But in the 1940s, when Elia was fitted, it announced her life to come in the English countryside, her formal enrollment in the world of the squirearchy, hunting, going to the point to point, the harriers, the beagles, the open garden scheme, the charity fate. During the war, the princesses Elizabeth and Margaret had worn just such lace-ups to review the girl guides to launch ships. Elia knew none of this when her narrow foot was measured, size five and a half, but the left slightly longer than the right. Though she understood that she would no longer be stepping out of a summer evening, arm in arm with her sisters and cousins in their strappy cork soled high sandals, to, straight, to swing down the Lungomari in, in Bari, let alone squeezing the warm, wet sand under her bare feet by the Adriatic, near the harbour of the city where she grew up. The brogues would walk her safely on turf and moorland and through woodland and along riverbank, where the trout twinked to the surface for water boatmen and flies, and take her striding across winter fields where the pheasants whirled up a flurry of gorgeous feathers against the unrelenting grey. The brogues would plant her on. They would transplant her to British soil. Oh, goodness, yes. The I see them as a Cinderella shoe, kind yes. of shoe that was she had to fit into to become a princess. Yes, yes, that's right. It's heartbreaking to think. Shall I show a photograph of her? Yes, Shall I, shall I show do. a photo? Yes, if you uh, so it's I'll just share the screen. Oh, sorry, I've I've lost it. Hang on, it's not turning up. 
No, sorry, I think I've done wrong. I think it's wrong. Sorry. I think start again. No, we. I think we should. Mm, I'm not. I'm not seeing the PowerPoint. Oh, it's so fresh, frustrating. Okay, so should we just um, talk a bit about the passage because that passage is emblematic of um, of of the way in which you structure the book, the way you move from. Yes unreliable memory to very reliable objects and the, what, what the um, what the audience will have noticed then is oh here we are so here are the brogues so I'll, I'll do it here are the brogues so now I'll do it on the right <laughs> yeah. yes but I need to put it on on I'm not getting the view option hmm um, so let, let me, I, I, have to, I, can't, I can't find the view option to make it go into a different. Um, hmm, strange. I don't know why. We can, we can locate the, the brogues as the third, as the third to the right. Yes. Here they are. Yes. I don't think, oh, there. Yes. Okay, we'll do it like that. Um, yes, no, I tried to um, example this, this, these objects, which are very important in the, um, so I, I try to do very accurate descriptions, and I see this as one form of realism, the actual de de sort of ekphrasis, descriptions of living objects. And what's interesting about writing is that you can go very deep into the external character of something, but you still can't seize it, because the meaning of the object is actually beyond the ex its external characteristics. And I found that very, very interesting that, you, that by making these quite extremely detailed descriptions, I was actually memory and imagination need to be there to bring them to life, to yes. bring, to bring. So in the case of the camera, my father's camera, the, the dark chamber is a dark chamber, which needs to be filled with other, you know, with the, the kind of the, the matter and the, and the emotions and the passions. And this was a moment of fantastic epiphany for me because I found this canister of, uh, with W.H. Smith written on the outside. And um, I opened it and inside there were two in, intertw intertwined coils of negatives, which I took down to the you know, snappy snaps in the high street to develop. And what I found was the honeymoon, the role of my mother on honeymoon with him at this stage in her life when she was when she was like this. And um and then inside that the film he'd shot of the bookshop burning. Mm -hmm. So these were the two moments in his life that were really the, the crystallization moments, the happiest and the most tragic. He never really recovered from losing the shop. And your, so, your um, father never had these developed. Sorry? No, he wouldn't. No, he had. He had them. He'd had them developed. It's just that, the, 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 I mean, I hadn't seen them. The ones of my mother before, uh, they weren't in the album actually. But the um, the ones of the burning bookshop I'd seen before, but I hadn't seen this this conjunction of the honeymoon and the burning shop. Negative. All this time in this aluminium canister, and that somehow seemed to me to be, you know, both talismanic, and incredibly reverberative. And, and huge sort of piercing insights into both their lives, really. Yes. Now, do you, um, in, the, in the chapter where you talk about brogues, which is called brogues, you also talk about the bro um, language and, and the brogue of speech. Can you say yes. something about this? Because the book is deeply about language. <laughs> well, actually, one time I was thinking of writing it as a glossary. Right. It went through it went through different different permutations. It took me a long time to write. So it began as a novel, and then I then I moved it into an inventory of these objects, these sort of memory triggers, and deposits of passions. And then I found that um, 
you know, as you say quite rightly, that I began really becoming fascinated with how words mattered so much and how some words concealed concealed depths of you know concealed depths and other words were kind of class shibboleths and markers you know so I have yes quite a number of words I mean I begin with magari which is the Italian for inshallah for god willing and I see my mother as moving through life under the star under the you know the uh, the influence of this this word, which is a Southern Italian word, and comes from the Greek for grace. Sort of, as it were, give me blessing, give me grace, hopefully, cross fingers, inshallah, you know, and, um, and, then, and then I have various other words, but another one later is is the Arabic, you know, so, so what can one do, help, you know, a shrug, it's a verbal shrug of shoulders. And I, I like these, um, yes, I liked very much exploring these words. And brogue seemed to me to be an important word because it was used to be thought, thought of as a, a, a dialect, you know, something that's sort of not proper speech. Yes. And that's changing, fortunately, because we're now much more interested in how people speak and then local places and what, is, what, what local languages are like. But um, and I was interested because my mother, you know, obviously spoke and speaking extremely well she proudly speak English at all when she met my father she only knew the words of some American songs <laughs> like like tea for two and two for tea mm -hmm. and um, and um but uh, she kept that as it were brogue you know she kept the Italian accent the Italian intonation Italian gestures so she was identifiably even in her masquerade as an English woman um she was identifiably still Italian. And I was interested in that, uh, that way that language carries its own. It, it, Seamus Heaney calls it the under ear memory. Exactly. And, um, and I think it's important, the under ear memory, actually. I loved your description of the way in which French was used in Cairo. So you describe yourself, you have an Italian mother, her father who speaks a kind of PG Woodhousean English. <laughs> <laughs> French is yes. spoken in Cairo, but you're also, as a child, speaking a little bit of Arabic. But what you just, what, can you say something about French and the pocket dictionary? Yes, I found that my mother had a dictionary, French and Italian, a tiny one, which she must have kept in. I think she had another one, English and Italian, which she kept in her handbag. Um, and, um, and it was the polite language of Cairo and the kind of um elite French word, elite language of Cairo. And it was very much affected by the English. They would sort of drop into French to show how elegant they were. Um, it was uh, the language of the upper class, the, uh, the Egyptian upper class, the Copts spoke French, um, the Copts being the Christian Egyptians. And, and, and there was a, as it happened often with the emergence of nationalism, and there had been a struggle to establish Arabic as the language of the country for all, not just for the <coughs> more working class people. And, um, and Farouk, King Farouk, um, was, who was king when my parents went to, went to Egypt um, after the war. I think he became king, sorry, my, because I wrote the book a while ago. I'm, I, think, I think he became king in 1935. Anyway, young, he was very young and he, um, and he was the first ruler of Egypt to speak Arabic as his, as his native tongue. I mean, he also spoke French, but he, he was an Arabic speaker. And for this, for this and other characteristics, he was absolutely beloved when he came to power. He was handsome, he was tall, slim. He, was, he sort of epitomized the, the hopes for the new Egypt. And part of the sort of catastrophe of that whole period um, was symbolized by his decline. He became extremely fat, totally very, anyway, he's, he, he kind of disappointed the, the Egyptians, but it had begun in great hopes. And that was around the, the struggle for Arabic. When my father opened the shop, it had been passed that all foreign interests had to employ Arabs. So that was, uh, that was a good thing that had happened. They had, they could be, they couldn't, they could, had to be a certain component. I can't remember what the percentage was, but there had to be a certain component in any staff. So the, the staff actually of W.H. Smith was a wonderful, you know, mixture of all kinds of 
of um, people as, as exists in, or existed then in, in, in Egyptian society, where it was very cosmopolitan, as you know, very, you know, there were Greeks, Italians, in, in Jewish, a huge Jewish community, which had been there for a very long time. All of this was ended by the, the, the disruption, the, the violent, of the form that nationalism took um, after that, during that, during that, those 50s, the, the years of the 50s, and finally, and NASA was really put in an impossible position. So the book covers a little bit, I and mean, this is in the background because obviously I'm a child and I'm seeing it through a child's eyes, but, but I did try to fill in a little bit about that. And it was a, it was a lost opportunity because it's this kind of colonialism that we still see operating now, I'm afraid. Or Yes, I think it's important to, to stress at this point that this is a memoir um, which most of most of the events took place before you were born, and so it's a <laughs> memoir of your yes, of your yes. parents your parents' union in which a lot of the um, exchanges between your parents, their courtship, your mother's experience of kind of meeting her in-laws for the first time, which she did alone because your father was still at war when she came over from Italy to South Kensington. You, you, you've, had to, you've had to reimagine and you reimagine it in this very novelistic way, which also strikes the reader as absolutely true. It must have been like that. <laughs> Now, can you say something about the whole experience of um, writing writing a memoir where you had to imagine so deeply your your parents' life before you were there? I've actually it's I, I imagined it so intensely that I actually it has replaced any other reality in my mind. Um, so so it's it's almost impossible for me to see it as reconstructed. I I do feel that I lived it. Yes. I mean, I, I did transpose certain things. For example, my mother returning to London, not returning, sorry, coming to London for the first time. Um, I actually used my first memories, which of course are very unreliable, early memories are, but of my first arrival in London after living in Egypt. So, I, so, so the things, and the, 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 time, the, the time distance wasn't so great. So things like the bus routes and the roads and so forth, I could do that from my own memories. And the and the bomb, bomb sites, the bomb sites were still there when I came back to England from Egypt. I mean, it was still sooty. It was still coal was still being delivered, and hurled down these chutes um, by people covered in coal dust. Yes, yes, you describe the you describe the grimness of of, of London seen through your mother's eyes very vividly. Well, there's a lot of, of course, there's a lot of testimony to that from contemporary writers and diaries and things. The, what, what, what England was like after the war. Uh, no, yeah. we, were, we had won the war, but at a great cost. One of the, um, there are so many unreliable, this is a book of stories. This is just, this is you in storytelling mode. There's hundreds and hundreds of stories and the book proceeds by way of diversion and digression. You're taking a line for a walk or taking a memory for a walk or an object for a walk and opening each object up and the stories pour out. The story I found most engrossing because I had no idea where it was going to go was the story of Hildegard. Oh, really? Can, yes, you, I, can you just talk? talk I don't well. think I've got a photo of her. I think oh. I took it out because I wasn't, I didn't know, yes. Well, Hildegard was a, is a singer, was a singer. She's, she was quite well known in America, actually. And we had always been brought up to um, delight in the fact that my father had this complete set of gramophone records. They were real gramophone records, you know, heavy vinyl, in a special cabinet of their own, which was the entire uh, repertory of... Hildegard, and that she had been his girlfriend before the war. And my mother was always very proud of this, which is rather mysteriously. She didn't show any signs of jealousy. She loved the idea that he'd had this glamorous girlfriend. She was much and older. We thought she, was, she was German and much older. Yes, yes. yes. We thought she was, yeah, we thought she was Marlene Dietrich, you know. This was, we thought it was just um, this, this, yes, was, as you said, this sort of German uh, siren who, um, you know, was the older woman in my father's life. And um, and I began researching it, and which led me into a, you know one of those marvelous labyrinths of, and um, 
she, Hildegard died at the age of about 99, not that long ago. And she died and asked to be buried in, the, uh, nu in a nun's habit. And then reading deeper into her life, she wrote a book too, which I read. Um, I found that she had been gay her entire life. <laughs> <laughs> we had been brought up on this wonderful romance, which my father had never exactly denied. But then they might have been pals. I mean, they, you know, they might have, uh, well, there are these photographs, which I found in the garage, uh, de dedicated to, with messages that are not just a, an autograph, because they say, it has been so sweet to know you. Mm, so sure. that all seemed corroboration. And she but was I think at the same Wisconsin. time. Hmm? She was from Wisconsin and not Berlin. Yes, that's right. She then, <laughs> yes, she was a good girl from Wisconsin. And, uh, so all that was, everything was, and she was the same age as my father. So the whole thing was punctured, absolutely. And it all blew up. And, and, and I do think it's just that, you know, I'm sort of f a fantasist. I think, I think this was a, an established historical memory in my family, not just my fantasy about her. That, that I felt very had. For your father there as well. I thought, you know, your father is married to the siren. He's got one thing. He's got one thing in his credit. And that's that he had this fantastic siren before. <laughs> that's right. Was yes. yes. And it wasn't true. And he must have known. You know, he well, knew. My, and my, mo my mother loved it. And she, she used to go to Hildegard's concerts after my father died. And she always went backstage and, you know, and, and really kind of you know relish the fact that she was still intimate with this wonderful figure this glamorous figure of course. glamorous figure was a devout gay, gay lesbian a sort of christian lesbian there, there was a lot of gayness in your parents lives wasn't there because yes. your mother was courted by a number of men who all um, seemed to be homosexual themselves well, yes, I mean, certainly it, that, that I didn't reconstruct backwards. That, that I, I mean, I, that was a fa yes, an aspect. I mean, I think it was partly because it was easier for, I really don't know. That's not something I've really, I, I try to confront it, but there, there, are, there are points in the book where the unreliability is my admitting that my imagination can't quite go there. And people's sexuality is so mysterious. I think she was, she became a Samaritan in later life and helped a lot of people with her counsel because she'd had a lot of experience. And I think she was, you know, friends with a lot of people who had troubled sexualities. So I don't mean, yeah. I don't mean that, that they, I mean, they didn't know what they were. I mean, we're thinking, we're talking about a time when it was much harder to be out and gay. Absolutely. So a yeah. lot of people were, were, were struggling with the obloquy they felt society was you know, would show them if they came out. Yes. And I think the world in was a very restricted world in that way. Can I just bring you back to the idea, what you, what you just said about, um, you just couldn't go there. I mean, there are, there's so, every memoir has silences and you and, and you talk about the silences in, um, in Esmond and Elia at the end of the book where you say, you know, reading your mother's diaries, you realize that, you know, she, how incredibly unhappy she'd been. She'd been quite desperately unhappy and she'd wanted to leave him and, and couldn't leave him. And the arguments were, uh, the arguments were horrific for her, but you're not going to go there. You're going to let her, you're going, you say, I think you're going to let her ghost be in peace on this one. And I wondered whether that was, what was what was the decision making process around kind of not digging into the troubles of the marriage because actually until that point you think the marriage is i think it's actually going quite well you think of course she's sacrificed everything and he's not and he has kind of molded her into this kind of parody of an Englishwoman, but at the same time, kind of romanticizing her as this Italian, this Southern Italian woman. So there's a lot of confused fantasies mm. going on there. But um, yes, but, but my blood ran cold when I um, came across this letter and he wrote to his parents after meeting her and said, um, you know, she, 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 her, her, circle will, her, her circle will be my circle. Yes. Her life will be my life. 
And he described he explaining. He was explaining to his parents that he, why he was marrying a penniless, and uh, reassuring them that you know she wouldn't bring any infection of Catholicism. Or <laughs> yes, course, she right. did. She did. She brought us. We were brought up Catholic, but um, you know she wouldn't bring anything of hers. It would be going to be perfectly right. You know England would not be rocked by this <laughs> new, this new, these new elements. So, that, but it chilled my blood, it really did, yes. Well, not to go there, I mean, I feel a certain, you know, a certain um, kind of pudeur, you know, kind of modesty on her behalf. I mean, yes. I, I mean, of course, now everyone's going to want to read these diaries. Now. So, um, you know, because they said things that I just didn't want her to be exposed by me after she's died. Um, saying that's all I mean I just felt I didn't want I mean it's all it's it's one thing for me to write about my sexual humiliations or whatever um or my sexual passions but it's a little bit different to ventriloquize that on behalf of someone I... else actually and, and of course in the case of my, one's mother there's there are other very complicated feelings yes I, I, of course, wanted. I wanted to kill the man in question. That that was clear. So maybe I'll write a maybe I'll write a revenge novel. Yes, and you. There are several images of your mother I found very striking, and the first is where you describe her. You describe going to visit her in hospital after your little sister Laura is born, and you say she's surrounded by flowers, like a saint on a saint's day. And I thought it's such a strike. I thought that's such a Marina Warner image. You know? <laughs> and then yeah, you well. also describe your mother on her deathbed as like a kind yes. of like a, as a graven image. And I, mm. I well, you can see where I'm going with this. I mean, I, I did you was your the iconography of your mother, your mother's strong sense of herself as an image, as a powerfully beautiful, sexual, but, but married woman, kind of formative in your own fascination with, um, with female iconography, with Christian, like with Catholic iconography, with the Virgin Mary, the yes. Magdalene. Yes. Well, I, you know, I used to laugh that my parents they would sit on either side of the fireplace and my be reading Vogue, and my father would be reading the Times Literary Supplement. <laughs> <laughs> and I feel that I'm absolutely halved between, you know, you because are, I'm, because I'm, you I've been obsessed with books. <laughs> Sorry. You worked for Vogue, didn't you? The, yes, yes, I did to begin with, yes. Mm. I, 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 was, I, I worked on feature, features. Um, but um, the, the Catholic thing is, of course, tremendously central to my approach to uh, literature really um it's not I, I i gave up believing a long time without a struggle as often happens with such things but um i i don't i'm not i don't have any spring to return to the church um at all but i do use a lot of what i learned um i still use that and it's to do with meditating images uh, ritual, use of language, the uh, very strong insistence on imagining uh, when you pray. You know, I mean, I, I, I have I have some ethical doubts about whether how good it is to to actually meditate on torture the way we were invited to do. Um, but um, but the discipline of actually imagining what is not in front of your eyes, but living through it physically um that's really quite valuable for a writer actually so um and there are other aspects of catholicism that i also feel have helped me have felt formed me i, I mean i'm quite interested in the approach to the examination of conscience and confession because again this is a kind of subject formation of subjectivity that's far predates freud and is but is you know quite close to I mean well obviously confessions of Saint Augustine are the earliest most brilliant memoirs we have yes yes can um this is your must be your 41st book <laughs> <laughs> well, depends how you count you know, it depends how you count 
<laughs> but it's it's the first time you've um, you've spoken this openly about about yourself mm-hmm. and about your background. And was why why did you decide to do this? Because at the same time as speaking openly, it's a memoir in which you are, <laughs> which ends when you're five. And so <laughs> there's not much ego here. Is what yes, I show, I show myself being, being trained, trained, trained to be a little girl. Here I am, yes. you know, uh, the two members of my mother's household and me and my sister. But you see, I'm very, I was, when I first saw this photograph, I was very ashamed of it because I'm holding up my skirt, you know, trying to be a little girl. And yes. I've got my dot, and I've got my dolly, and the ribbons in my hair, and all that. So I was, I was very much brought up in this, you know, super, super ultra feminist femininity mode. A lot of dressing um, up. You describe yourself as a little girl dressing up all the time, and your mother's kind of masquerade of femininity. Yes. yes. This is, you see, this is us going to the zoo, and I'm dressed as if I'm going to a wedding. <laughs> <laughs> I mean, she made me these. She made me these one clothes. I mean, I, it was extraordinary, really. But um, so, well, the first. The, the, I mean, I decided to do it. I think because they're both dead, and um, I mean, I so I began it as I said before she before she died. But I, I end the book with this image of the Egyptian figure of the worker in the afterlife, the Shabti. This is um. This is a Shabti. You will have all seen them in um, in museums because there are just hundreds of them, thousands of them are found in the tombs. And it's the figure of the answerer. The Shabti means the answerer because an inscription is a chart on their skirt at the bottom there. There's, and it, it says, here I am, you shall say when you're summoned at any time to do the work to be done in the Acropolis. So these are figures who are put in the tomb to do the work in the afterlife and to answer to the needs of the dead. And, um, and when I was you know, exploring Egyptian mythology and everything for the book, I, um, I felt this is exactly what I was. I was. I was my mother's Shabti. I was listening to her and trying to understand her needs. And I was saying, here I am um, in the book. And, um, Yes, and um, partly to my father too. Yes. So, what but I, but I probably will write a little bit more now, autobiograph, a little bit more, because I've now lived long enough that I actually have lived at some historic times. So it's quite, it's you know, it's quite interesting to to sort of go back and explore those times. Well, let's just talk. And about now we're living in this terrible moment of the, you know, the overturning of the right to choose, and other other pro- world problems that are arising in which the, the work that, well, the, the kind of what we felt had been achieved by my generation in the 60s and 70s, we didn't think it would be overturned. We didn't think, we thought those were rights that had been settled and the rest of the world would want to have them too, these freedoms. So seeing what's happening now, it's, it is quite interesting to revisit you know what went wrong what what steps were taken what happened yes shall we just um turn to the final scene which is really the central scene of the of the book which is the burning of your father's bookshop mm-hmm. and 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 you use this to kind of to think more broadly about the um about the the burning of books and the end of eras and of course the the like the library of alexandria and can you and and you say that your father your first memory and this, you say, is not an unreliable memory. The, the, the first words you remember your father saying were, it's burning. Mm. And here's yes. the picture, yes. This is the picture that your father took from mm. the balcony of your, of your family penthouse, looking over onto the burning of Cairo. And you thought that he was talking about the whole city burning, but he meant just his shop, because his shop was, was set alight right at the end. It was an afterthought. Yes, that's right. Mm. Um, and it destroyed him. And you yes, remember? It was, my fir- it was absolutely my first memory. And um, I had, I did get some things wrong because he actually left quite a lot of very detailed accounts of what had happened. So what I, what I had remembered was that he'd come home from the office and had had this terrible shock. And 
And then, um, but actually in his own accounts of what he did, he went back and forth all day because he knew there was danger. So he came back, you know, he kept coming back to see we were all right and then going back again to see the city and see what was happening. So I had remembered it's you know, not, not entirely right, but it is my first memory and um, also one of my first memories. And, and then uh, above all, we went to the shop the next, very soon afterwards, he took me and um, my, my mother didn't come, which is, and we, and we went there and saw it. And I remember just a cage of iron girders with a huge heat of ash in the middle and lying in the middle of the ash, the lavatory bowl with the name Shanks, for some reason I sort of, this is, you can see how unreliable all this is. But anyway, the building wasn't entirely burned. It was, it was charred completely. The in, in, inside was completely burnt. All the books were burnt. So this is the two tables um, of the books. You can see two, two tables of books. That, and um, you can see the books are sort of charred. So it wasn't a heap of ash like, a, you know, like a bonfire, as I had remembered it. And it's unlikely that I, the lavatory was sort of sitting on the top of it. So all that <laughs> is probably misremembered. But certainly that was, and it raised so many questions about, you know, what the British were doing. It seems, uh, an, you know, outrageous to burn a bookshop. And then, but if you then get, if you get deeper into what was happening and how, the British were still not of not allowing the agreements for independence and autonomy to, to to fully to be fulfilled, and they were and and afraid that my father was involved in a kind of soft power experiment. He wanted to sell books, French and English books, all the way across Africa. The idea was that this would be a bridgehead, and it was before the forty eight war, um, the forty eight sorry not the declaration of Israel. So. Um, they also thought they would go to spread across to the Middle East. They didn't count for that area to be concerned in such conflict. So it was, you know, doomed from the start, really. But it was a, it, it was a, it was a latter day cultural imperialist idea to have this bookshop, I'm afraid. But it was also, of course, a cosmopolitan bookshop, serving a huge clientele in Cairo that were great book lovers and great collectors of books. There were lots of antiquarian books my father collected. Um, he books about Egypt, which he sold to a specialist clientele. Mm. I know this from the letters because there were lots of letters to him after the burnt, shop burnt down. And several of people said, oh, those beautiful books, how terrible to think they've all been burned. So this was the antiquarian section. Yes. It must have had a formative impact on you. Mm as someone who was then as your house is now presumably packed with books. I mean, you live inside books. You, you're, <laughs> you're, you're reproducing books for the world. <laughs> <laughs> yes, and yeah, no, I think it is. A, I mean, it's, it's, it's a very nice thing for it to be brought up in a bookshop. Yes. Um, but he did have another bookshop after, I mean, several other bookshops afterwards, the first in Belgium and then in, and then we came back to England, Cambridge. Uh, and so, was brought up in shops all my life. That for a writer, he was very indulgent, and he always brought me books that he thought would interest me. And and um and then um the, but then to have a to be in you know, to be to know that a bookshop can be burned down was of course a very formative experience. If as as I am, you are interested in politics and interested in the cultural politics and. What it means to you know what what a, what a culture is, what a civilization is, and what the limits of that where where that touches upon darker things. I mean, yes. civilization is not just a simple thing. I mean, exporting civilization is not a simple thing. Dara, I'm just looking at the questions in the Q and A here, and there's a question from Gary Marshall saying I'm only two thirds of the way through, but your digressions are obviously Proustian. Was this an influence to the structure of your lovely book? <laughs> oh, that's very kind. Thank you so much. Well, I'm very, I mean, I am very fond of Proust. And um, yes, and, and actually Proust said that his book is going to be like magic lanterns um, in a turning lamp that he has at the beginning. That's that's so something that I find very very close to what I try to do. The idea of the sort of light, the, 
the ma that magic lantern light size of memory. Your, your mother read Proust, didn't she? Yes, yes, yes. She could read, for, yeah, she read well, she, 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 she was good at languages because she picked up French very, very, very well. She was a fluent reader of French. She had great love of certain French writers, Proust and Camus. And, yeah. But you see, it's, it's it, saying that it makes her sound sort of different from the way she struck you. Because um, though she struck you as completely sort of obviously bright and lively and she hid her interests, her sort of intellectual interests. And she, she did say things to me like, you know, I, I mean, she said, look, you know, you really mustn't um, contradict people, especially men. They don't like it. And um, you mustn't show your clever. They don't like it. <laughs> this is somebody who learned to survive talking, but it's not the way we want things to be or I want things to be. God, she must have been so disappointed in you, <laughs> contradicting, not hiding your intelligence. <laughs> well, well, I wasn't what sort of being too obnoxious. I wasn't being obnoxious, but I suppose, yes, I mean, yeah, but you can see the sort of handmaid's tale side of it, really. You can. A question mm -hmm. Ian Hume has said, um, do you think, um, how do you think your parents would feel about your portrayal of them? Pleased, shocked, upset? Did this occur to you when you were writing? Did you think of your mother looking down on the page? Uh, yes, I mean, I mean, obviously it contributed to my inhibitions about certain aspects as I was talking, you know, as we were talking about earlier, but um, I couldn't have written it when they were alive. And I, my father was inordinately proud of me, which is really very, but I did write something once a long time ago and uh, in which I talked a little bit about him and he just roared with laughter, but I think I'd wounded him. Can we just talk about your father's laugh? You yes. have one of my favourite um, few pages in the book, my favourite few pages, are devoted to your father's laugh. And it's, I don't think anyone has written so clearly and vividly about someone's laugh before and what that laugh says about them. And it was this mirthless laugh that your mother then started to impersonate. Yes, yes. And at what stage did you realise that there was something wrong with that laugh, that, that it was... It was disguising a, a, a bitterness, a hollowness, a seriousness. Well, it was warding off, warding off more troubling things. I mean, it's quite widespread in English society, actually. And it is, I mean, gallows humour is a, is a resource. It is a way of oneself against hurt. And we see it, I mean, a lot of the sort of English buffoonery is, um, is a defence. Yes. And, um, I mean, often of lethal people like use it, but um, I mean something about yes, my father's laugh was because of his temper, which we you know were, were, were sort of frightened of. Um, it was all alarming. His laugh. It, it felt like it felt violent. It it, it, well, it felt like the counterpart. You know, it felt as if it was like the, the, the diptych, the other side, the flip side of, it could, and it could flip over. Yes. It was a bit manic, really. Yes. But it was also filled with that confidence, which is that sort of British confidence in, in supremacy and our, you know, power. That's why and that's, off, 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 that's off, why off. your mother decided to, that it was important that she had the same laugh because she was well, taking on... And confidence. Yes, yes. Well, she yes, and she was influenced. It was. I'm afraid it's a sort of slight class sign, a sign of class. Yes, mm. yes. So a question from Elizabeth Lewis. A beautiful, interesting book. I wondered, thinking, for example, of Norman Lewis's Naples '44, whether Marina's mother wasn't needing a protector as much as her husband. A Very family... good question. Okay. Sorry. Yes, no, sorry, the, the family, beautiful daughters had survived fascist Italy and the Germans. Perhaps this lies in the area Marina can't bear to look at. 
Well, that's a beautiful comment. I mean, I absolutely love Norman Lewis's Naples 44. It's a fantastic book. And um, yes, I mean, she, yes, she, she was making an alliance. You know, it was, it was her fortune. She seized her fortune. And yes, it was a protector. He was a protector. Yes, it was, I mean, if, if there's some other, there's some marvelous books about that period. I mean, Natalia Ginsberg's Lexico Familiare, the family lexicon is another marvelous book about Italy during those really, really difficult, harsh, violent times. And um, another one is, uh, I mean, Lexico Familiare is about this Jewish um, community and, 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 and the really quite serious persecution, which has not been discussed as nearly as much as what happened in Germany. But um, the other one is The Garden of the Finzi Contini, which is another marvelous book um, by Bassano. And um, again, shows this. My mother didn't come from that part. They, it, she gets, Southern Italy doesn't have such a, didn't have such a community of intelligentsia. So um, it was much more, you know, much, well, suffered more from mm -hmm. malaria and other problems, poverty. And um, so um, th there wasn't quite the same character of fascism in the South, but it was very, very dark. and. They, they were not, a, they were, her mother was widowed, there were four girls, and um, dowless, very difficult. And, um, and they didn't have the means and all, all the background to be resistance, but they didn't like it. And my mother was taken out of school by her mother at the age of nine, which was the youngest you were allowed to leave, they were allowed to leave, but she took that chance. So she, my mother was educated by her sisters at home um, because her mother, the widow, didn't feel that something she didn't like what was going on in the schools, which of course was indoctrination into fascism. And, um, and, you know, and it went on, there was deep corruption. Even the church was corrupt, which horrified me when I first heard that. Yes. It's a question from Myra Dorrell or Dorrell about the, um, about the objects. Glad to hear the Proust question, but I also wonder if Marina Warner knows the work of Ponge and his voice of things. Yes, yes. We, we just focus on the thinginess of the things here. Yes, right? yes. Uh, no, yes. Yes. Yeah, that's absolutely right. No, I, I like Francis Ponge very much. In fact, when I worked for Vogue as a features editor um, back in the 60s, um, I did a tiny feature on him because he was coming to London to read at the Institut Francais. And, um, and I had a rather wonderful photograph taken of him by one of the Vogue photographers, a tiny piece. Um, and um, and I, I love, I, I, they were very much in my mind when I tried to do my, I mean, of course, I can't attain what he, what he achieves at all, and his poems too. But um, I, I, I had that kind of, that was my attempt to try and make the objects, yeah, capture them in language. Yes. There's a question from um, Chuck saying, is this the same book as Inventory of a Life Mislaid? Yes, Chuck, this is yes, the, uh, yes, <laughs> that's yes, the, yes. the Americans mis um, changed the name. Uh, I, I, was, I didn't protest at all. I was, I was rather touched, actually, to yes. have my parents' names emblazoned like that. I never would have thought of it because somehow it would seem too, some, too personal but, um, or too... You know, it's not interesting enough, um, but um, no, but I think it works actually. I like it now very much. We've just got two minutes left before the end of the interview. And I'd like to ask you about your sister. Yes. <laughs> I, I teach memoir writing. And the first question always comes up is about ownership of a story. And if mm. I tell this story, then my sister can't tell it, or my sister mm. will not agree with, with my experiences. What did, um, did, what's Laura's response to? Yes, well, my sister is an art critic and she writes under the name Laura Gascoigne. Um, and I was absolutely petrified that she wouldn't like it. Um, it was the single most <laughs> alarming reader. I, uh, you know, when I finished it and gave it to her and I, and I was so relieved because she said she loved it a lot. And she, with her only regret, she said, was that she was too young to remember Egypt herself. Yes. So I was, I was, I mean, for some reason she, 
I thought she might not like the last scene where my mother dies um, and she might find that too obtrusive, you know, and, uh, but she was, she likes it. She says she likes it. So I was very, very, very relieved and very, and grateful to her too, because exactly what you said, that she could have felt that I'd stolen all the material. Yes. Yeah, I think she's writing a book herself now, but um, <laughs> um, yes, about, about um, the Italian community in, in, in London. I see. Well, we'll have a lot to look forward to. Um, this has been so fantastic, both of you. Thank you so much for this really wonderful conversation. Um, those of you at home, please consider purchasing a copy of Esmond and Elia from Community Bookstore. We hope to see you at another virtual event very soon. Thank you for joining us, uh, Marina. Francis, thank, thank you for Francis, staying up with thank us. Thank you so much. Thank, <laughs> thank you. you so much. Thank you for doing that. Thank you. Right, thank you so much. Good night. Take care. Good night. Bye bye.